shy, are you? It's recording. Good. Let me know if you need it. Okay, so obviously before we start massage, we have to give our client our normal directions about what's going on so we don't surprise the client. Describe how we want them undressed. This works a whole lot better if they don't have anything on. And of course, we assure them we're going to only uncover the parts, which is everything except for the gluteal cleft and the genitals when they're on their uh, face down when they're in a prone position. So you can use a sheet. I prefer a smaller towel for the draping, but you can use a sheet. When I'm teaching this, what I normally do is teach the upper half of the body, give them a break, then come back and teach them the lower half of the body. So what I'm teaching, I only uncover down to the gluteal cleft and then cover the back up, uncover the bottom part when we're doing that. In a real life scenario, we don't do that. We go ahead and drape them and expose everything except for the gluteal cleft and the genitals from the get-go. So what I generally do for that is I'll take the top edge of the sheet here, pull it down to about the middle of the back, and then I like to use what's called an airplane drape fold it and make it paper airplanes when you're little. So I'll just come to the end of the table and pull this down to about mid-back. Mid-back so it doesn't start, give you more room to, uh, doesn't fall off. If they're really comfortable with you, I go a little lower. And then I just, again, make an airplane, put a finger in the middle, pull this one straight down the middle, Pull that side straight down the middle. Fold it again. Again, just like you're making a paper airplane, just straight down the middle here. Each line. Okay. And then all this in the bottom can just go between your legs. And make this here as small as you can. Fold it a couple more times if you need to. Now I'm just going to take and grab part of it here, pull it up like that. So I can, if I'm going to push this drape up under the client, they can't feel my hand. I got sheet on both sides of it. However, I prefer the client to help. So what I'm going to do is, then I'm going to push this up. I want you to take one hand, reach under your hips, and pull this up just as far as it's comfortable. Good. So then, now you avoid having to put your hand up in their groin. So now I have a pretty good area here, so I can do pretty much everything. If I'm working this side of the body, I can move it that way. If I'm working that side of the body, I can shift it this way, or just leave it in the Again, a, a, a smaller, thinner towel works better because it doesn't get in the way as much. And when I get down to here, again, I don't want this in my way. And none of this down here, of course, will matter when you're working up here. As soon as you get on the table and you start doing this half of the body, you don't want to have to stop and fill with this. If you do, it's okay. And we'll have her demonstrate exactly how to do that. So for barefoot massage, you notice we don't have a bolster. This is what all of our students are required to have a king or queen size pillow, wide enough to go from side to side. Let's go that way a little bit. You're good. I can move it without moving you. And the pillow between their knee and their ankle. So he's pretty good. So when we're applying nice pressure down here, he's supported well between that ankle and the knee. So this is a good, good setup for him. And when we get ready to work on the bottom of the feet, if we actually use our feet to massage their feet, then we just push the pillow that way a little bit when we need to. So before we start our massage, what we normally want to do is go ahead and lubricate head to toe, and including all the way out at least to the elbow, because some of our strokes are going to go out over the triceps, all in the deltoids, all the way to the elbow. So I tell the students they should have a towel at least on one side of the table, because you should be able to lubricate head to toe both sides from one side. This way you can walk, if you've already cleaned your feet, you can walk next to the table without your feet on the dirty floor. Mm -hmm. So I know Jessie has already cleaned her feet, but you have not lubricated your client, so let's go ahead and have you lubricated. Other than that, the um, headrest should be at the most comfortable position for the client. The chair that we're going to work on, in this case we have a tall stool, should be about the height of the client's back. Yeah. If you have a really, really low table because you're fairly tall, then you might use a shorter stool. If you're really short, some of our students are, they have the table way up here, then we might not even do the work standing on the stool because we don't have a stool high enough. 
But in your private practice, you can get much higher stools. Bar stools. These run about $19 to $29 to target Walmart. And we mentioned these sometimes get a little wobbly. We have two here that are mounted on two foot by two foot square pieces of wood. Uh, get like three quarter to an inch of plywood, and you can just use L brackets to hold it in place. That way there's no wobble, it's real stable. I actually recommend, we don't have, a, have it here, using three stools for your own cutout. I would have a stool here, here, and here. That gives a lot of stability and um, different positions for the therapist to get. So if you're, if you're practicing here and nobody else is doing a barefoot, get two other stools and put them up there. Now the other thing is, Jesse is sitting on, did you pull that thing out so I can show you? This is simply a kitchen liner. You can buy it in rolls from anywhere. When it's new, it's pretty sticky. So you can stand on these on top of stools without sliding, even if you have lubricant on your feet. As they get older, they lose their stickiness. So um, when I was practicing this, I would just buy a new roll every couple of months. Just cut off a piece that I needed long enough to cover the hang down on the sides. And then when you started losing the stickiness, throw it away. Here they don't get thrown away very often. <laughs> so, but they should. Okay. All right, so once we've got the client lubricated, you've got the lubricate head to toe. If you were going to cover, if they were cold and you were going to cover the lower half while you were working on the upper half, then I put extra lubricant down here because when you cover them, it's going to soak up some of it. And that might um, mean you have to put a lot more lubricant. Yeah, so we want to make sure that. <laughs> The therapist is comfortable if their feet are clean. They can see their feet when they do the work, and they, they don't have clothes on um, at the ankle, lower than the ankles to drink, rub all over the client here. And then we're going to have the client, the therapist, actually get up. So use a step stool, a short stool, a tall stool, so you can actually get up on the stool. So Jessie's using the short stool, which is easy for her to step onto, to get up on the tall stool. So some of our work is done from the stool on the upper body. Some of it's done standing on the table from the upper body. And if you'll look on, you probably don't have a copy of this, do you? Yeah, have made it up. These are some of the guidelines that, um, all of this is in the barefoot manual, which is in the alpha student folder. So it mentions uh, some of the things we want the therapist to be familiar with and the client to be familiar with before you actually start the massage. So what I tell the student in the beginning for training is what I want you to do first with the client's arm hanging off the table just like this. Go ahead and step up on the table and walk around and get comfortable with the table. Just use the bars for balance. You don't have to get a death grip on the bars when you're walking around. It's just so you'll feel comfortable that, hey, it's safe. I'm not going to tip the client. I'm not going to tip the client or the table over. My extra weight is not going to crush the table. So we want the therapist to be really comfortable with that. Also, when we have the client walk around, I want them to pay attention, particularly if it's a male client, but some of our females have the same issue. When you're walking around the table, be careful of putting your heel or your toes right near the armpit on armpit hair. Because that hurts. Okay? And if it's a could be a guy, even if he has extra fat. But mostly on females, if they have large breasts, don't step on the breast tissue on the sides up near the armpit. That's also very painful. And obviously, if you're working on males, don't step on the genitals if you have to be standing between the legs. But if you've got a drape like this, this is real clear. You can see where you're at. So there's absolutely, if they're draped right like this, there's no issue with, where can I put my foot? Where can I not put it? All right. So when you're doing the actual barefoot massage, this is designed to let gravity help you do work. So it shouldn't be an effort on your part. So if you position your body correctly over the part you're working on, then gravity and your body weight does the work. Don't stretch too far. So for example, don't keep one foot in here and go ahead and try and reach down here and work here. So hold on to the bar and try that and see if you don't feel a little awkward. And get down to here. So up to here, she could use her body weight, but now she's stretched. Now, in her hand, if she was working here, one, at least one hand should pretty much be over the foot that's doing the work. But 
try not to get stretched out like this, because now it is working, and it's not supposed to be. So go ahead and go back up, up there. So typically, it's most effective if your foot and your knee are in a line and there's a hand right above it. So if your hand, knee, and foot are all in a line, you can use gravity and your body weight to apply the pressure. You shouldn't have to push with your leg muscles hardly ever. There may be a few times, but not normally. All right. You can get used to, you can feel their bones and muscles with your bottom of your foot, just like you can with your hand. It has the same receptors in there. The difference is, of course, your hands are not made to apply heavy compressive forces that most clients seem to want, and your feet are designed to do that. You stand on them all day, so this will take the pressure off of that. When we're working on the back, on the erector spiny, that's one of the things that makes this real effective. If you go nice and slow, and work your way in until it's really deep, that sympath uh, the sympathetic nervous system calms down and we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system with these deep low strokes. So it's great for pain relief and just calming effect because of that nervous system effect. With practice, as you're walking around the table and moving your hands, so one hand is over your feet, you'll get good at doing this effortlessly so the client doesn't hear your hands move. Usually when a student is starting, you can hear them because they got such a tight grip. They let go and they grab tight over here and the client can hear that hand shift. After a while when you practice, you don't hear that. When I'm asking if a student wants to be certified in barefoot massage or a licensed therapist, they have to give me a massage. And if I hear their hands work on the bars, they fail. The other thing is so some of the students ask, how good do I have to be? If you can't wow me, if I can tell you it's just learning, or practice it, or there's any effort or strain, you're not going to get certified at it. So you just have to practice a lot, just like with your hands, to, to be able to get certified um, with this. We're only teaching them to use one foot for the work, so that one foot is either going to be on the stool or on the table at all times. That's the stable foot, the, the weight foot. The other foot's the working foot. Most of your weight, most of the time, is on the table or stool foot not the working foot. Okay? Now you can learn with practice, you will learn to shift the weight slowly to the working foot. So even if they're gonna put, like one of the things we do allow them to do is put their foot on the sacrum at the end to do a sacral press. Um, most of your clients can take all of their weight, but we want it to be a sh slow shift from the weight on the foot, most of the weight on the table, to the foot that's gonna be up here. And they do a slow change, and we use the bars to take some of our weight as we're shifting from one foot to the other. We can apply weight to pretty much anything on the back. If the client does not have knee problems, you don't when you're gliding or doing compression, you can work directly on the back of the knee because if you've got the foot sideways, it's not possible to get into the popliteal fossa. Because a lot of people say, isn't that an endangerment site? Yes, the popliteal fossa is an endangerment site. However, that just means know what's there and know what can harm it. So it's deep sustained pressure into the popliteal fossa that is our concern. So don't take your big toe and press into there. But if your foot sideways, it can't get in there. So you can maintain your pressure from your hamstrings to the calf or the calf to the hamstrings without lightening up it with concern for the popliteal fossa. You might have concern if they have knee issues on the front of the patella. Pretty much the gluteal region and the back it takes tremendous weight. However, never, ever put pressure on the back of the neck when you're standing up. If you're sitting on a stool using your feet to do massage, then I work on the back of the neck. But never put a foot over the back of the neck when you're standing. So uh, some of the classes around the country, and I used to teach them with Ruthie Hardy, do have some strokes when you glide up and actually put your edge of your foot under the occipital bone and do a stretch from here. Beginning students should not do that because if they're not used to doing this and they slip, don't, don't apply pressure. So don't play, don't ever put your foot over their neck. That'll be the safest thing to do on that. Again, just like when you use some hands, if the tissue is healthy, you can apply deep pressure to it and it won't hurt. So if it hurts or something going on, you might have used too much pressure, but you probably found some injured tissue when you finish a stroke, just like with your hands, I know even triggers, uh, in the beginning we taught 
like if you're gliding up the thigh, you don't just stop and come back. You round off and glide off. We want you to do the same with the foot. Don't just finish the stroke and lift up. Kind of round it off or lightly drag it back. Since you're going to be using more pressure with your foot than you normally do with the hand, we got to make sure we don't compromise the client's skin. Don't let it get too dry so you can stretch it. If there's too much lubricant, however, it's hard for the therapist to control the movement. Same with the hands, but even more so with the feet if you're trying to do a lot of pressure. So it's going to take a little practice to get used to, okay, how much lotion should I apply? So we have them apply lubricant before you start the massage, but they also have the lotion bottle with them hanging at the hip or hanging from the bars up here. When they need to apply more lubricant, once they've had some practice, I don't want them bending over using their hands. I want them to put the lotion on the bottom of their foot. We'll have her demonstrate that and then spreading the lotion with the foot. Again, we don't like to surprise the client with just like with hands. We want to let them know what's going on. So if you're going to do anything that you haven't been told them that we're going to, Sure you do. Okay, so that's pretty much the um, basic introduction and the safety concerns that we're going to go over. They can read me anything else about contraindications, indications. So we're going to have her start with. You have the. I do. So is it single erector glide or is it the rhomboid? Scapular border glide. Scapular border glide. So this is very similar to what a lot of people do with their hands. If we could get you to put your left hand in the small of your back, now you don't have to have their hand in the back when you do this, just like when I'm using the hands. But just so she can see this pop up. So go ahead and put your hand back down. You saw where that was. So she's going to take her opposite side foot, her left foot, to come over here. And she's going to glide, use the inside of her foot, big toe side, to glide from as high up as possible, following the border of the scapula down to the side. Sticking, you need more, lub more lubricant. So as you can see, she's already put applying lubricant to the bottom of her foot. And we've been sitting out here for a while. So she's applying more lubricant, and she's going to do a glide using the medial side, the big toe side of her foot, right next to the scapula border. So we're trying to warm up the tissues between the vertebral border, the medial border of the scapula, and the vertebrae. We want the foot to stay off of the spinous processes. It's okay if they touch it, we just want, don't want a lot of deep pressure with the ball of the foot and the heel of the foot. So when she notice how she comes over, her foot is going down as far to the table as she can. What I like to see when she pulls her foot back here now is a roll of skin. So I want her to use her heel. See that nice roll of skin that she's got? I want to see that drag back. That lets me know that we're getting some nice pressure in there and we're going to affect the connective tissue. So we do several of these strokes back and forth. When you step forward, you notice how she shifts her weight forward and the hand's right over the bar. She's doing that just right. Some people keep their legs straight. Some people bend their knee when they're coming back. Whatever is comfortable for you. But you notice how she's also, because her stroke is coming this way, she turned her body. That's exactly what you, you don't want to stand still like this try to do that. You want to start with your body in an angle so it's nice and easy for you to do this stroke. And on your outline is the next stroke? It is the scapular protraction? It is. Okay. Ruthie calls this hot dog in a bun. So this one I do, put this hand in the small of the back. Because this one, what we want to try and do, you see the vertebral border of the scapula popping up. We would actually like to see her get the little toe side of her foot, if we can, under the scapula, under this vertebral border. And then we want to apply pressure down on the ribs and then out to the side, pushing the scapula laterally, which is protraction. And we always want to do this nice and slow and within the kind's comfort. Some people love it, some people don't. So in this, we're going to switch feet. And our little toe is going to be right down at the inferior angle. A little more right here. And now she's going to do a little inversion, lift the big toe side of her foot slightly, press down and try and slide her foot out either under or against the edge. Yeah, now she's under really nice. So typically once they get under good, what I, her, big, her little toe is completely gone over here. 
So I tell the client to take a big breath in, exhale slowly. When they breathe in, I try not to come up with the foot, and as they exhale, I try and go deeper and laterally just a little bit. So Deb, would you do that for us? Big breath in, and then exhale. Good, and she went quite a bit. And I'll hold this for eight or 10 seconds if it's comfortable with the client. If not, I'll let go immediately. Let's go ahead and put this hand down. So generally, I would then warm up and do the same thing on the other side. So she's going to take her right foot now and glide along the scapular border, warming these tissues up. And if you can see these tissues here, it's really red. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of work. Foot. So this warms up the tissues very nice. You can see her movements. Let's put this on like. Yeah, you can see on that side pretty good. That's what I'm watching on the screen is to see that you can actually see her foot. foot needs to stay between the vertebrae and the medial border of the scapula and she's doing a really good job on that. You can see how her foot's going down towards the table and then when she comes back her heel is going to pull and try and glide a little, pull a little roll of tissue. Awesome. See how she rotates the body? That's what you need to do when you're doing this out to the side. Pressure's good, Dan? Yeah, it feels nice. Awesome. All right, now put your right hand in the small of your back, and we'll do that scapular protraction stretch. Your right hand. There we go. And then let it relax. Let it, let it relax. He's good. Don't let it go in a minute. Now she's going to, with the little toe, right at the inferior angle, she's going to invert, push down on the ribs. Go ahead, down, take a big breath in, and exhale slowly. That's it. Now you can see that scapula moving out real nice. A lot of your big guys will love this movement. See how his elbow's coming down, so he's starting to let go. And with practice, again, we hardly ever have to do anything with our hands. We want to use our foot to actually just take it out of the small of the back. Okay. And the next step on here, is it a single erector glide? It is the single erector glide. Okay. Electric so the single, we'll have her start with her right foot. It doesn't really matter. But single means we're working on one erector spiny group. And glide is obviously epleurage. So she's going to take her right foot, place it, just to find a little more lubricant right now. I'm going to place it over the erector spiny on this side, the big toe side, right next to the spinous processes. Apply pressure first and then glide down. And I actually like to glide till the heel hits the very bottom of the lumbar region and her toes can actually go onto the gluteal area if they can do that stretch long enough without being uncomfortable. If not, don't worry about it because they're going to get on the table and do a lot of work here. But if they can comfortably go down and sink that heel into the lumbar region, this feels awesome. So you could do this with either foot. When I was practicing this regular, I much preferred using, in this case, on the left side, I would use my right foot. It's easier for your body the way you're standing up there. If she tried to use her left foot over here, she would have to cross her feet over and that would not be as comfortable. So typically when she's starting, she's got good pressure and both her hands are back there. You notice as her foot glides this way, her hands came forward. So deep pressure here, her knee is here, and her hand's right there. So that's a perfect line. So she's doing a really good job of using her body to do that. Yeah, let's do one more. And then we'll switch and do the other side. So when I'm demoing to students, sometimes we only do three or four strokes. If you've got an owl just to work the back of the body, you're going to do a lot more than three or four strokes here. So I've had students come out and say, it only took me 20 minutes to do this whole thing. You know, how many strokes did I do? Three of everything. Well, you might do 12, mm -hmm. 15 of these. Now she's going to switch, and she's going to work on his right erector spiny group with her left foot. Again, this is the single erector glide. You can think of just a single foot on the single side of the body, epilogue glide. 
It's the same thing I would do with my fist, my forearm, my hand. This is no different. Every student, if they've been trained in basic massage routine, does some sort of gliding over the erectors. This is just easy, especially for a lot of pressure. I see students want to use their fingers and their heel of their hand and their palms to apply deep pressure back here. That's crazy. You're going to hurt yourself. If they need more pressure, and you pretty much have a, using all your foot a flat foot, then there's several ways you can increase pressure. One is to um, evert the foot if you're using this. Other ways to dorsiflex. If you dorsiflex, get the ball of your foot off the client, then all of your weight goes to the heel, which will double your pressure because it's half the surface area. This is a real popular stroke for clients. This double erector glide next. Yes, double, double erector glide. Next. Okay, so the double erector glide means we're going to work on both erector spiny groups. It doesn't mean that we're going to use two feet. It means we're going to use one foot. So she's going to use the heel of the foot for one erector spiny group and the ball of her foot for the other one. So she turns sideways. The arch of her foot is over the spinous processes. So in this one, sometimes, because we'd like her to go all the way down to the hip, I'm going to just fold this out of the way just a little. So she's going to apply her weight first and then glide down over both erector spines. Again, the arch of the foot is over the spinous processes. This feels marvelous. And if they're comfortable, they can get a nice stretch on the lumbar region. So at the end of the stroke, the foot is on the top of the gluteal region on the um, iliac bones on both sides, and she can get a good stretch on that low back. So we use this double erector glide for two reasons. It feels wonderful, and it's our transition stroke to get on the table. So the next time she does this double erector glide, at the end, she's going to slide her foot off to this side of the table. And when her weight, when her foot's here, all of her weight's going to go to this foot, and she's going to place her left foot here and do a double erector glide up. Nice transition stroke. Now she's on the table. But instead of having to step onto the table and walk around and change everything, at the end of one stroke, it flows right into the next stroke. So again, we want them to stop when they get to the cervical region so we don't take a risk of pressing down over the neck. Now when they're on the stool, it's easier to apply a lot of pressure to the upper half of the back. Once they're on the table, like she is right now, it's a lot easier to really get into the lumbar region. So when she puts her foot here, I generally tell people, sink in, sink in before you start your glide. Sometimes I just hold that 20 or 30 seconds straight down into the lumbar region. And but after you get your pressure, then glide. When you're using your body weight, you notice she's gliding to the left and her body's moving to the right. That's just natural physics. If you put your left foot on and lean to the right, your left foot's going to your left. So you notice she's, she's using her body weight really well. If you're tiny, you've got a big person on the client, once she's got her weight down here and she knows how to pull up her weight on the bars, it's not uncommon to see somebody lift the table put completely off and use all their weight um, on here. So let's have you try that. Put your foot back, left foot up here again. And what we're going to do is make, to make sure that he can stand, handle this weight, what I want you to do is just gently shift your weight from there to here. Is that weight okay, Dan? Okay, now lean and glide. Yep. So some people hold their foot up, others put it on their thigh. And when you get up near here, wherever you need to, you put your table foot back down. Dead. That's a lot of pressure. But you've got some big people who leave a lot of pressure when you're doing that. Okay? All right. So from our double erector glide, I'm guessing the outline now says single, single erector glide up. After the double erector glide down, up. Uh, double erector glide up. Then goes to latissimus oblique and serratus. Okay. So it's similar. This double erector glide used her left foot coming up to work the erector muscles. Now she's going to lean back a little bit. She's going to put her heel close to the table and her toes up here, her left foot, other left foot. 
Face this way. I was like, who knows? Face this way. Drop your heel. And you're going to work here. Oh. That's it. You're going to work abdominal obliques, latissimus dorsi, serratus anterior, and you're going to glide all the way up on the side of the body, just like you did up here. When you hit the vertebra on the axillary border of the scapula, go, keep going with nice pressure against that lateral border of the scapula. So this will work the teres muscles, the latissimus dorsi, the serratus anterior, and the abdominal obliques. It's the same glide up here, just applied here. So the difference is they usually have to put both hands on this side of the bar and lean back like this so they can drop the heel and glide up. Same stroke, just different area of the body, different muscles. One more. So great for shoulder work. All right, next one, single erector glide up. Yes. Okay. So now she's going to face the head, and she's going to take her right foot, and she's going to place the heel just above the iliac crest. So we'd like for her heel to be in the lumbar, um, lumbar muscles, so we're going to be on the, again, erector spiny and uh, quadratus lumborum region here. Sink in. Now she's going to glide straight up over the erectors until her foot comes all the way up over the top of the upper trapezius muscle. And I'd like to see her stay in contact so her heel stays in contact with the upper trapezius. And when she's on the front of the upper trapezius, then pull back using her heel to work the upper trapezius and glide back to the beginning. Very nice. And then she's going to do another stroke. So there's several variations of this single erector glide. Okay, so no, this is good. <laughs> so this is the basic one, up over the shoulder and straight back down. So this is a basic single erector glide from the table. A single erector glide up, run up toward the top of the body. From the stool, it was a single erector glide down. Here it's a single erector glide up. And again, if you need more weight, invert your foot, you use the heel. Now let's you notice, stay there. Now we're going to show you a couple of variations on the single erector glide. This time, when you come up over the trapezius and you start to pull back down, stop when your heel is at the inferior angle of the scapula. Press down, then we're going to glide over the scapula focus in on that infraspinatus, and then glide out over the posterior deltoid and the triceps, all the way to the elbow, and she's going to lift her foot and put it back in the starting spot and do it again. So it starts just like the first single erector glide, straight up, good, and she's going to go all the way up over to the, over the upper trap, go back with her heel, but this time she's going to stop at the inferior angle of the scapula, flatten her foot out, come over the scapula, over the posterior deltoid, over the triceps, all the way up to the elbow. That feels really nice. And then you just lift your foot up and come back in. So it is a slight break, but remember, I know that it's the intention of not breaking the touch that counts, not actually never breaking contact. No. It's okay. And the infraspinatus is an often neglected muscle, which causes, me, in my experience, most of the shoulder puzzles are so So again, this is a variation. It's the single erector glide up, but instead of going all the way back down, we stop here and glide out. The third variation is going to be doing like circular friction above the superior angle of the scapula. What some people call their sweet spot. With me, the common trigger points about a you know, half an inch to an inch above that superior angle. So this time she's going to glide up and either stop with her heel or pull back with her heel, looking for that sweet spot. And I, once she finds it, she's going to do a little circular friction. I like to do like, I tell my students, do a little hula hoop move with your hips. And that way you don't have to use your, your foot. The smaller you, the move that you do, the better. Some people use their leg muscles to do the little circle. Some people do the hula hoop move. Whatever's comfortable for you. And I ask the client, is this the spot you really want me to work? Or is it a little higher inside, outside? Where's your sweet spot up here, Dan? You have one? Right there? Okay. So I actually ask them, and they'll tell you. Sometimes they'll reach up with their hand, grab your foot, and put it there. That's fine. I, I tell them that's fine. If you know where's your spot back here that you like the most, they'll reach up. And, that's fine. I, I want my foot in their spot. So these are the variations of the single erector glide: up and down, coming up over the upper trap, over the infraspinatus, deltoid, and 
triceps, and then do a little circular friction. I mean, you can do that. If they got two or three spots you want to do circular friction on, that's fine. What's next? Uh, Other side of the body? Uh, lateral oblique serratus right on the opposite side. Okay, so now we've done this side. So what we're going to do is she's just going to step to the other side, face this side now, and repeat all the strokes, basically. Mm -hmm. Except for the double erector glide here. Now, if you want, if they really like that, I would do that again. But you, since you work on both sides, you've already done it coming down, you've done it once going up, you don't have to repeat that one, which is why I have the obliques, abdominal obliques, and latissimus, and teres, and serratus as the next stroke. And you can use whatever foot you're most comfortable with when you're applying the lubricant, which is what she's doing now. Just applying lubricant. And then she's going to lean back that way from the bars on that side, drop her heel so she can get actually on the obliques and the latissimus. And she keeps going when she hits that scapula. She tries to put pressure with either the inside or the outside of the foot as far as she comfortably can. You can do like she did it, obviously, and go back over the shoulder and the arm if you like to, but you don't have to. Sometimes I'll just go straight up um, to here, but it does feel kind of nice. You can sort of round it off. That's what she's doing. She's improvised and made it feel nicer. But this works the teres major and minor, the latissimus, the serratus anterior, and the obliques really nice. And from there, she would then do the single erector glide with her left foot going up. She would do all three variations. Basic one again, straight up over the upper trapezius. I don't know if you guys noticed how she changed foot. Yes. When you're using the bars, if you're going to change the foot that's on the table to a new position, just pull up on the bars for a brief second that it takes you to reposition your foot. Again, if you're fairly small, this is a pretty safe stroke. You can typically put your weight for a second or two on the body. But you have to know, it depends on the person doing the massage and the person on the table. Small person doing the massage, big person on the table, yes, when they go to change that table foot, they can temporarily put all their weight on the erector group. Other people might have to use arm strength, biceps, brachialis, to hold some of that weight up when they shift move that table foot. But she's been demonstrating real good. I haven't been pointing it out. But where her pressure is, her hands and her body has been over. But that's how you use gravity and your weight to do this work. Did the single erector glide up. Now she's doing the variation where you got to go out over the scapula, infraspinatus, posterior deltoid and triceps. All the way to the elbow. And she's going to do the circular friction in the sweet spot. And is that the upper part? Uh, it is. Uh, single foot fold. Okay, single foot fold. Okay. And low back circle next? Correct. The order isn't critical, it's just, you know, if you're going to teach a routine, you can right. so start with the routine. First. And start with the routine and then adapt it to your client's needs. So single foot fulling, let's go ahead and go to that one, can be done a, a, a couple of ways. Fulling is a broadening stroke, so everything we've done so far is to lengthen the muscles in this direction. So now we want to separate them the opposite way, we want to go to 90 degree angles fully usually is. It's a broadening stroke. So there's a couple of methods. So from that side of the table, she wants to take put her heel or the side of her foot right next to the spinous processes here, push down on the erector spines, and then push them this way toward me. That's a great broadening stroke. And it's pretty easy to do. This is one method to do fully here. If they just want work here, this is where I work it. Otherwise, I like to go all the way up to the lower part of the neck. Just before we get to the C7. Can you just go into the media border of the scapula? Up here it would, yes. Okay, so now another way to do that, she's going to face the head of the table, stand in there. She's going to take her left foot, place it over here, Keep the weight on her heel and fan her foot out laterally. Just turn it like this. There. Keep the heel there. Lift the foot up. Push down. Now she's using the ball of her foot to push the erectors away. So she's turning her foot. Trying to keep the heel right here. You just turn it. That's it. So you push it down here and turn it. Now when you get to here, lighten up. Bring 
it back in, push, and swivel. So then lift up. That's one method. Okay. Now another method is what she was tempted to do, just push the whole foot sideways. All of those work really, really well. So again, her foot is on this side, my side of the erector spinae, so she's not running into the spinous processes. She's pushing away from the spinous processes over this way. So some people like, if they're, you're little and they're big, use just the heel. If you're close in size, this might be the best way to do it. You can also, earlier I, showed, I held her he heel in place and she swiveled the ball of the foot. You can do the opposite, hold the ball of the foot in place and swivel the heel out. Whichever feels better. That feels harder, doesn't it? That's why I usually use the ball of the foot or the side. Okay, so now low back circle next. Good. Okay, so when I teach, Massage using the hand, go ahead and put your foot back on the table for just a second. One of the things I teach is find the iliac crest, curl the fingers, pull in this way, do your fingers hit the finest processes, flatten it out, go down a hand's width, and do that. So this is a stroke I teach with hands. You can do that same thing with the foot. So she can use the ball of the foot, the heel of the foot, the side of the foot, whatever she pleases. So you can actually apply nice firm pressure over the sacrum. So when she pushes away, she actually applies firm pressure over the sacrum, going down. Then her foot should go above the iliac crest to the tissues above the iliac crest and pull back until the heel hits the spinous processes. Then she goes down and goes back out. So if you want to think of it as a circle, you can. Or you can think of it's a push away over the gluteal regions below the iliac crest, go up a foot's width, and a pull towards you above the iliac crest. So if they need more pressure, just use the heel. If they use less, use, use as flat of your foot as you can. Good. All right, anything else on the upper part? Uh, glute twist and center. No, that's the lower part. So oh, we're sorry. Gonna, we're going to take a short break. That's good. Because we got all of our students sitting yeah, out here. It.